Hi, you're listening to Collectively Speaking by the Birthday Collective, a bottom-up initiative to develop ideas about Singapore's future. Welcome to this space where Birthday Book alumni have conversations about the things that matter to them, to us, and to Singapore. We hope that you will be a part of the many conversations we will have, or perhaps to even start your own. And now, onward with the episode. Hi, welcome to Collectively Speaking. And our podcast session for today is on entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Kenneth Goh, and I'm an assistant professor at SMU. And uh, with me are my guests, Mr. Alan Lim, who is the uh, founder of Comcrop, Ms. Pamela Chung, who is the founder of Better Barista, Ms. Huang Xiaoning, who is the founder of Job Central and Angel Central, and Mr. Guok Jiachuan, who is the founder of Conjunct Consulting. So welcome, everyone. So um, let's start with trying to understand your motivations for uh, starting your your ventures. Um, Alan, would you like to start? Okay. Concrop is actually started as a community farm back in 2011. Um, back then, I think it was quite an interesting time for Singaporeans where we start to see that the communities are not as harmonious as we think it is. So me and a couple of friends decided that maybe the way to get our communities to come together and be more harmonious is through growing food and sharing food. So we went along to to ask the government for a small little piece of land back in Bukit Panjang and experimented with this open community farming concept whereby we built a little farm and we invite the residents to come in and and the residents could get themselves their fingers dirty, you know, come and work and sweat and, and share the harvest of the, the, the effort, the, their labor. So we did that for a while and we realized that instead of having more senior citizens coming, we have a lot of young people. And through our conversations, we realized that the young people actually cares about the future, that then they see food security as a important problem. And this is back where, back in 2011. Right? We haven't even talked about the high-tech farms of today. So we decided to then see what can we do to help solve the food security issue, right? And it dawned upon us that there is indeed an opportunity to make use of marginalized land plus technology to take a step at growing more food for Singapore. And therefore, in 2014, we went up to to um, escape the rooftop. And from then onwards, uh, we have progressively, progressively made improvements. And today, we are running the biggest rooftop farm in Singapore, and we're producing a lot of vegetables for the supermarket. It's such an exciting story, Alan, yeah. um, that you're thinking about food securities from 10 mm. years back. Yeah. Um, but I think that we're not there yet. We're still mm. quite far away from that, right? Yeah. And I think we're only there when you're able to grow durians on the rooftop. <laughs> yeah, durian will be a tall order. Yeah. <laughs> but I think what we are seeing today is very different from 2011. Mm. Mm. Today, we are able to grow a lot of things in controlled climate conditions, in clean rooms. And technology advancement is amazing, right? Uh, we're seeing anything from tomatoes to cucumbers to even potatoes being grown indoor. Um, so I'm quite confident that in the next 10 to 20 years, uh, we'll see big advancement in this field uh, by Singaporeans. Mm -hmm. And that will be something pretty amazing. That's uh, really glad to hear. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and maybe let's hear from uh, Pam. Yep. Um, and if you could share with us your startup story, um, uh, tell us about Better Barista and yep. what was uh, your motivations for starting Better Barista. Yep. Thanks for having me, uh, Kenneth. Um, so, Better Barista was started uh, in 2011 as well, uh, you know, and uh, really the idea was uh, I wanted to challenge the notion of how business could be done, right? And it was started uh, from the outset as a social business, right? And the idea of how to use business as a force for good um, and how do, we, how do we create and run businesses 
that was sustainable in in all manner, right? Uh, good for people, good for the environment, good for the ecosystems that they exist in. So we uh, so we started uh, Better Barrister as a kind of specialty coffee company. So using coffee as our vehicle for change, uh, to work um with marginalized uh, women and youth at risk, and basically give them a holistic toolkit of skills to uh, improve themselves, uh, develop the skills to pull themselves out of their own very challenging situations. Um, so kind of, so we, we have education, we have coffee manufacturing, we have uh, retail outlets, and this entire ecosystem is really built to create then uh, sustainable end destinations, sustainable employment and jobs. Um, and uh, so that, you know, it's been hmm, nine years since then, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and and you've picked up a couple of awards along the way? Uh, yes, we, I think we've been very uh, lucky along the way to have been, uh, been able to work with a lot of, you know, great partners who support um, what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's just, I'm... I'm happy that we're still here. <laughs> you know, when we first started, it was like, no clue. No yeah. clue if any of this was going to work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it's just so exciting to hear about your reasons for starting a business that go beyond just a profit. Mm. Um, and maybe I'd like to hear from Shawning about your startup story and how, how you started um, Angel Central. I'm sorry, Job Central. Angel Central is your current, yeah. um, your, your current venture. But tell us about... Um, your motivations for starting Job Central? So the the original name of Job Central is, was actually Jobs Factory. So it was started in 1999. Uh, so it's actually quite far back. Um, so that was the year I graduated. Then I came back to Singapore and I realized, you know, it literally in Singapore, fresh grads, Bolang Ai. Um, it was actually lit- literally treated as a cheap labor. And we, we saw the problem, me and a couple of friends, and we were bitten by the dot-com bug, right? We're studying in the US. And then we realized there's, a, there's an issue here and I think it's something that probably with the internet, we can try to solve the problem. And long story short, um, that's what we did. We did for 11 years. We tried to solve the problem for 11 years. Um, jobs is still a big problem that Pamela is trying to solve at the same time. Um, uh, and then long, along the way, I think we, we learned a lot of stuff about people, about processes. And then, uh, so... In 2011, 2012, we were bought out, we were acquired by the US side. And then um, we we learned about um, growing into big companies was not something that as founders that we can transition over. <laughs> it was a very painful process. Mm-hmm. So we decided to, to take a stop there. And so we left, literally technically retired in 2014. And then we actually in between... Uh, we had a couple of other gigs as well. We tried to do other st- stuff. So you were talking about uh, motivations for entrepreneurs starting business. It's actually always because we spot a problem and we want to solve that problem. And so along the way, different gigs didn't work out. Um, then in 2017, 2018, we realized that in the startup ecosystem, um, the startups get pretty good support um, with the governments, with the campuses and with the universities. But the angels, the investors are not getting support. And so we saw a gap here and we had this community that kind of like just forming, mm-hmm. right? And and uh, then we thought that why don't we structure it? That if we can support the angels to invest better, to learn better in this whole uh, ecosystem process, then ultimately the beneficiary will still be the startup. Then we can keep the ecosystem going. And so that's how Angel Central came about. Shawning, just uh, for listeners out there, yeah, angels. What are angel investors? Are these like very holy investors? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So angel investors are typically individuals using personal resources who invest in the start- startups in the first uh, twelve to twenty four months, mm-hmm. typically before their 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 Series A investment comes along. Uh, one of the problems that we realized after we technically retired, we spent a lot of time with other founders in the market supporting them. And we realized one of one huge category of their problems actually come from their angels. So angels typically are supposed to come with white wings and hello, but unfortunately there are some angels who the colors could have changed a little along the way. Mm. So we tried to mitigate that. We became because now we changed side on the table, right? So we became good translators. And in, in a sense it's a mini movement, not as grand as Pamela's Star Wars, but we're trying to Star Wars. Bridge, bridge the, the, the the understanding and try to you know, shift the way that uh, right. the, the angel investors could behave to support the founders right. better. 
Yeah. So Satan was a fallen angel as well. So, <laughs> so, so I think we are trying to. <laughs> we're trying to avoid. Uh, we're, we're trying to steer startups away from the fallen angels and and to grow the community of uh, heavenly angels. Is that is that my sense of what what um, you're doing with Angel Central? Um, I think we just want to help more individuals to come understand start, uh, su- uh, support the startups better. Then at the same time, we want to startups to understand the investors better because investors are not here. Uh, I mean, of course, the financial returns are the key here, but the invest a lot of investors actually sometimes it's because of their own personal experiences. It will cause their uh, their requirements or their checklist of investment to be- become a lot more stringent. So we see ourselves as a translator. So we translate to help investors understand startup better. The startups understand investors better, and hopefully, you come to a better outcome for everybody. Yeah, and 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 that can really help to grow the um, entire the startup ecosystem. ecosystem. Because I think one thing that we want to know is um, we want to remember startups. Okay, IBM is no longer sexy <laughs> IBM, but no nowadays is uh, C and uh, uh, Google. Right, Google didn't happen overnight. So the business need time to grow. So we need to support them. If we don't support them, we're not going to have those stories tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And 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 that and that's such a critical step in the uh, life cycle of uh, startups, mm-hmm. right? If we don't help them take that first initial few steps, they're never going to make that critical, uh, big, significant steps in the future. So so I love that story. Um, now let's hear from uh, Jia Chuan. And um, tell us about Conjunct Consulting and how you started uh, uh, Conjunct. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so very happy to be here today, Kenneth, as well. So um, for Conjunct, we were also started in 2011. So I guess that marks significant points for oh, all of us uh, on, on this podcast. I, uh, I was just 15 years old in 2011. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I had uh, pre- did, I had just graduated from university then. Uh, previously, when I was in university, I had um, done uh, volunteering um, extensively overseas. I had started Oxfam and a couple of other, other organizations out there, um, Isaac included as well. And you know, I, I had a full-time job um, I was working in the government and just started out, but I did notice um, a gap. And I think this goes back to, I think, the entrepreneurs trying to solve problems, I think, as Shanin uh, mentioned about just now. So uh, we noticed a gap that there were a lot of efforts directed at helping um, beneficiaries in um, in the sec- in the social sector out there. So, for example, uh, people with disabilities, you know, uh, people with broken families, people with mental health issues, for example. But there was no real concerted effort at really helping the organizations, you know, to help their beneficiaries better. So I think that's why me and my co-founder decided to set up Conjunct to really bring together students as well as like professional volunteers get them to use different skill sets to come together for the greater good and then you know help these organizations like areas where they felt that they needed help as well so we do things in areas like for example strategic planning um, impact assessment financial sustainability um, etc so we send actually teams of student and professional volunteers to help you know these organizations share ways you know that they can continue to improve and then take them forward to like implementation as well so over the past nine years we've worked with about 250 um, organizations we have 250 projects with more than 120 organizations in the social sector um, as well we train about 1,500 students um, together with like 500 professional volunteers as well to get them to, you know, deliver their skills for the sector as well. So, yep, that's um, what we've gone and we really hope that we can continue to push this, you know, uh, forwards as well. Yeah, yep, that's, we're that's, one of the beneficiaries yes, of that. Very, very, very yeah. happy to have helped Pamela yes, and Vetiveri study been a great partner to us. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, it's great to see the impact that you are having both for the businesses and for the students as well. Um, I don't, know if I've shared with you, but my top students uh, uh, always seem to have some link to conjunct consulting. I don't know if they're sharing notes or something amongst themselves, yeah. or maybe you... Uh, oh, you're okay. selecting really well, good guys or you train them really well. So I think one of the proudest things that I think that we've tried to build our contract is having that community. So we've had students, I think they come together, they train together, they work together, you know, with um, social sector organizations as well. And even after they graduate, they come back to advise, you know, future batches of students as well going forward. So I think that community, I think is really something that's um, been a driving force in our organization as well. And I want to keep that going as well. So thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. Did you, and Conjunct is... Uh, Conjunct operates as a non-profit? 
So right now we are registered as a charity, but we've always kept ourselves um, sustainable and really want to make sure that we grow and thrive by ourselves. We are actually registered also as a company limited by guarantee. So at the same time, we adhere to like, you know, standard principles of our company going forward. We want to make ourselves sustainable. We don't want to depend on grants or donations as well going forward. So we run ourselves as a proper business. So we want to make sure that we can stand our own two feet because only then, I think, then we can help other other people and really say we walk the talk, right? Mm-hmm. By saying that we are a well-running organization, therefore we can try to help you as well. So what that means is that you're providing services yeah. to organizations yeah. and businesses like yeah. Better Barista and you charge them for it? So we charge a low fee. So this is in a way a cost recovery fee um, as well. So again, we don't provide pro bono services, but we have this concept of what we call low bono, where I think we provide uh, services that you know ultimately reflect the cost recovery nature of what we do. And as a company limited by guarantee, we don't issue share capital or give out dividends. So any profit that we make is plowed back into continuing to improving the business, continuing to improve social impact as well. So this is, I think, what we call the plowback model, where we say, okay, what you what you create, what you invest, you bring it back and grow the company as well going forward. But I think that the yeah, part yeah. is making it sustainable is the key reason yes. why it can continue. Absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of people actually feel that, you know, if it's uh, purely for social profit, yeah. social profit as a non-dollar sign profit, yeah. mm. it, it really cannot sustain. Yeah. And after mm. all, we're in a quite a materialistic environment. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that part of it is also at a, you have to balance that desire for impact with that desire for sustainability mm. as well, right? And even a desire for scalability as well going forward. So I think everyone here will have their own stories, I think, of how they've, you know, faced challenges, you know, in terms of sustainability. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I'm sure everyone has overcome them as well. So yeah. So on that yeah. note about challenges and overcoming challenges, um I'm very curious about your journeys as entrepreneurs. You've talked a lot about solving a problem. Mm. And you know, in Singapore, um, we learn a lot about problem solving in our schools and we're always looking for the right answers. Um, So I'm wondering, are are you guys just geniuses with the right answers who know everything beforehand? Um, More crazies, I think, than geniuses. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. more crazies. No, I think entrepreneurs, uh, you know, they, they actually think that they can do something about a problem. And I think that that kind of, that optimism uh, is, I guess, the biggest thing that drives success, but also potentially drives failure as well, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but but I think, I think uh, it's this idea that actually you don't need to know everything because it's, it's impossible, you, you know, right? But I think to have that conviction and that... Um, uh, commitment to solving the problem right and uh, and not to get fixated on what that outcome is mm. but to really take that process right and kind of learn and grow along the way because what you start with is never what you end with on that point yeah. Ellen I'm curious mm. what did you imagine Comcrop would be when you started and how did that evolve or change over time when we started Comcrop, we only wanted people to come together, grow some food, and be happy and go home. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as so that. Yeah. But I think when you start digging something, and then metaphorically digging at a problem, you realize that it can be deeper than that. And when we when we started to look at that the depth of the problem, we realized that it, unless someone takes a initiative to start solving it, and don't even assume that you can solve it, just mm-hmm take an attempt to do something about it, then you can continue and see where the path ends. If you don't do that, and then you say, okay, this is somebody else's problem, then maybe somebody else will think that it's another person's problem and you'll never get solved. That was how we started the rooftop farm. It were, we were illegal for a long time. <laughs> because, okay, cut that one out. No, no, no. Thank you. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that now because when we went up to the rooftop, there was just no precedence. And I and we went we went on to tell the agencies that we're gonna do this. We were very transparent about what we want to do. Um the challenge is to get them to understand what we're doing. And if they don't understand, we're just gonna do it anyway. <laughs> so so for the longest time, and I've shared this in your class, right? Um I've I've always gone to the agencies and said, you know, you can tell me what you don't like about this, this project, but you cannot stop this. Because this is actually trying to solve a problem. We may fail trying to solve a problem, but we should not fail because of mm-hmm. all these challenges that we have to overcome. 
So those were the the challenges as an entrepreneur because I have to tell my team that they're breaking the rules every day. Mm. That they have to come to work knowing that at some time at some point in time you may be shut down. <laughs> so um as an entrepreneur and as a leader in the in, in the organization, you you need to you need to really balance that kind of negativity with what's go- what's lying ahead, the uncertainty that lies ahead. Mm-hmm. So I find myself um, at many times being very, very honest with our, our team. And I think those are, are qualities that I've sort of learned that I must have <laughs> and mm-hmm. when, when force myself to be, um, to, to speak in a manner that is very clear and to instill that trust mm-hmm. with my team. Right. Yeah. Because you're grappling, it seems that you're gathering people around the problem mm. um, without really knowing what the answer is. Yeah. But it's getting people who are jazzed about the problem. Yeah. No, so we know the answer is solving food security. But we don't know where the journey will go or mm-hmm. whether the path we are taking is the right one or not. And and we are consistently navigating in a very tight space back in 2013. Right? This is a very tight space, physically very tight space of, of a small rooftop. Mm-hmm. But in terms of the rest of the greater acceptance by the public, right? So we, we really get um interesting feedback. Oh, you are a rooftop garden uh, your food can eat or not uh, <laughs> the kind of thing um, but I'm quite glad that over time um, more acceptance has come about just because they realise that eh oh last time you have this uh, eh, you haven't died yet uh. <laughs> okay you haven't died means quite okay yeah so I guess that's the learning point uh. good thanks thanks for sharing that Alan mm. and Shawning it seems like you have something that you wanted to add about um trying to solve problems without really knowing the answers? So I think as an entrepreneur, you must have the optimism. You must be willing to push the boundary. Mm. But the thing is, sometimes you don't know where the boundary is because mm. if you don't get into the water, you don't know how deep the water is. So for founders who are willing, who, who we have that conviction that we are solving a problem. But the thing is, we have an ideal situation of what we are going to solve. We have this idea of what it looks like. But once you get into the water, you realize, oh, actually it's five degrees colder than what I expected it to be. Then you start to realize, oh, it's not what I thought it is. So I would say some, I would say a large percentage of people will stop there. But it's really those few like Ellen, like Pam, like Jiachuan, you continue pushing on. And then you continue trying to figure out how can I get used to this colder water than I expected? Or can I just shift my, instead of freestyle, now I change your frog style. Can I find another way to solve the problem that I wanted to solve? Or is the problem now still deserving to be solved? So sometimes you, when you change the problem that you're trying to solve, it doesn't mean that you fail. So actually, coming bring up the other concept about failing and achieving something, it doesn't mean that you fail. Maybe you just realize the problem is not as big or it's not as, um, what do I say? It's not as um, relevant as how you imagine it to be. Because sometimes we come up with a certain idea of it's what I think it is, right? It's how I perceive that it's important. But after I tested it out, I realized it's not that big a deal for, for that many people. Then it's not worth to solve the, the issue then you move on nothing wrong with that right because you learn it. the other thing about entrepreneurs is that we are always learning and the learning is true pushing the boundary experimenting mm-hmm. I'm sure that when we start with the, the coffees you actually don't know how to you know what's the the pressure to have how, how, how fine the grind has to be I'm learning about that now so it's really learning along the way but you must be willing to learn so if you're not willing to learn then I would say as a founder, you are at a dead end. Because if you are not willing to learn, I mean, bluntly put, as a founder, you are supposed to be the point where the bug stop. If the founder cannot solve the problem, please, this is not a big organization you keep pushing the file down. If you can't stop the problem, you can't solve the problem, nobody will stop the software problem for you. So you must be prepared for that, but you must have the creativity and must have the willingness and the, the persistence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you have an example where of, of having to deal with a problem that was kind of unexpected that you didn't foresee? And I, I'm looking at your face now, I'm guessing there might be too many. <laughs> um, so the good thing about founders is the, opt- op- opportunist, the, the op- optimum the optimism, the optimism that we come with it, right? So at that point, it was very bad. And right now, I cannot think of any. 
<laughs> this this is what I call the entrepreneur's uh, memory <laughs> loss. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, loss. it's it's like uh, I think like like women right they they forget the, the pregnancy you know the pain so that they can go and birth again. It's the same thing with entrepreneurs. I think you forget the bad moments just so yeah. you can carry on the next day. Yeah. I should I should uh, mention that to my wife yes, you know uh, be a bit more forgetful so you can be more forgiving of me. <laughs> okay, yeah. I don't know about that one but yeah. <laughs> and, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, and entrepreneurship in a way is a process of a constant reinvention, yes, right? You are right. thinking about, you know, what the problem is and maybe what you've said as you know the initial hypothesis you are st- you stand willing to be corrected. In. Yeah. In that regard, yeah. mm. so so I'm curious yeah. about your experiences, your rich experiences, yeah. um, in facing some of these um, unanticipated hypotheses or problems that didn't pan out the way that you thought it would. That really humbled you. When you are in, when you call yourself a farmer, you realize that it's a very interesting job, because for the last forty years, Singapore has kind of not have farmers. So when we decide when we decided to start this, right, we went around to ask, hey, um, who can teach us about farming? Uh? Right? So we went to the Lim Chukang and all this. And then we realized the farmers there were also pretty old already. And then the only people that really learned uh, were were kind enough to teach us were the community gardens aunties and uncles who knew a lot about growing something. Right? So they could be very good at growing winter melon or something and then they grow it very big. But we actually learned our first lessons from them after failing many, many times. So the team made out of very young people assume all the techniques from YouTube and then go and do and fail horribly hmm. and then only to have this very kind and decent, hey, it's not like this. Come, 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 come. So it was a very humbling experience because we realized that well, we, Singapore, think of ourselves as very high-tech and, and very advanced in many things. They're just, simple th- they're just simply things that we don't know. And, and there were p- people who have a lot of institutional knowledge of, of a lot of things that they have done in the past that they are very willing to teach us, give free. And I think those were very humbling times um, back in 2012, 2013. Um, that actually laid the foundation and to to what Com Crop is today, where because we are so inspired by them, we are now always giving priority to grow the the kind of food that the the bigger population of Singaporeans want to eat. Mm-hmm. So, uh, growing fancy is something that we don't like to do. Mm-hmm. But when we talk about Thai sim and all this, right? Well, my guys are really mm. uh, excited. So really inspired by aunties who come from like the everyday people, by the everyday people that inspire aunties. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, Jia uh, Chen. Did you have an example yeah. that you so, like to share as well? Sure. So, uh, when we were starting with Conjunct, for example, we to train our uh, volunteers and um, you know student volunteers as well, professional volunteers. We uh, took some frameworks, you know, from the corporate sector and said, look, you know, these are the ways you think about problems. These are the ways you break them down. And we quickly realized that, you know, a lot of these actually don't apply to the social sector at heart, you know. For a why, why we miss out blind spots, you know. We miss out things like, for example, the constraints that many organizations are facing, you know, uh, the, the training level, the technological limitations, you know. And even, the um, in a way, the beneficiaries, I think, that organizations tended to. Um, you know, all these different considerations, you know, whether it was accessibility, you know, whether it was the unique situations that, you know, these organizations really had to be factored in as well. And so to do that, we completely overhauled our training syllabus. We completely said, okay, this is, you are not there to impress people with like management consultant jargon or to, you know, put up broad solutions. You need to think about the constraints that people are facing in reality and apply them as well. I'm glad to think that that worked out for the better. But ultimately, I think it's about really recognizing that, you know, where you may be wrong, but iterating quickly to try and solve that as well. And I think that constant process is something that an entrepreneur needs to do. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I love those lessons about learning on the ground, trying to really get a sense of ground realities and being sensitive and humble enough to recognize that the reality on the ground might be very different from what you think it is. And being agile and nimble enough to kind of adapt to the realities on the ground. In the interest of time, I'd like to ask you about your thoughts on what uh, key entrepreneurial qualities might be. Um, You have 
walked the path and you've met many entrepreneurs. And I'm curious to know what you think might be an important trait for entrepreneurs and maybe for listeners as well. How might they hone some of these traits? Pam? Ah, oh, so many. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll start with one first. I think it's, uh, uh, I think actually being really open-minded and open-hearted uh, you know, not not to get, uh, I guess, too hung up about a particular outcome, right? Because exactly the outcomes, you know, um, the the larger picture I think is there, right? But to to have the, um, uh, I guess the, the the humbleness, right, and the openness to to take in divergent views, right, different uh, perspectives, and to really understand and listen. Right to people, um, so that open heartedness I think is very important as well because that is where collaborations come about. Right, uh, different ways of solving problems come about. Um, so I think that's uh, quite an important thing. So to be convicted and to be very clear about your vision, but yet do that in an open minded and open hearted way. Mm-hmm. And you know, it seems so so simple mm. um, but it, it, what you're really talking about are polarities or co- mm. paradoxes right? being convicted about yes. your vision about solving the problem but being humble and open enough to recognize that you may not have the answer and that you're probably going to be wrong yep. and the solution is going to come from somewhere else it could be uh, your aunties um, yep. who actually possess all that institutional knowledge yep. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's such an important lesson, um, especially in this context where we think of entrepreneurs as folks who kind of know it all. Uh, Shaoning, what about you? What do you think are uh, the key entrepreneurial characteristics? I was going to say that it's the desire to win. To desire to win, not in terms of the, the commercial definition of success, but the desire to win in the path that you've chosen to to solve the problem that you have chosen, but you're willing to listen to feedbacks along the journey and make sure that you come out happy with the solution that we designed and then the solution is relevant for a big group of people, winning in that sense. So it sounds it sounds like a a win 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 solution for all the parties involved. <laughs> I love the way you put it. Yeah. We're not just looking at win win, but win win win. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. Thanks, Shaoning. Thank you. Judgment. So um, I think one essential quality for entrepreneurs is grit. So I think having that resilience to keep going, um, even when you know everything seems against you, you know you have fires burning everywhere, your people are looking for you to leadership. And I think that grit and resilience is is important. Uh, there's a really good quote that I love, which uh, which is like everybody o- overestimates what you can do in a day but underestimates what you can do in a month of like hard work, grind and sweat as well. So, you know, everybody kind of like sees just what happens on the day, you know, that big announcement where you made the big launch that you've done. But, you know, behind that is months of hard work, grind and sweat. And I think to keep going in that regard, grit is important. So that's for me. I like that quote. And um, what I'd like to add to that is that everybody probably overestimates their own abilities, but underestimates the abilities that of the collective like the birthday collective. Look at the amazing work that they are doing. for that to happen. Yeah, that was, Very good. That was good. Iron sharpens iron. So, uh, yes. Shout out there. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Um, and, and I want to throw the question out to the group as well. Although we have a couple, <laughs> so we can't do that. But um, where do you think that grit comes from in your experience? And by grit, I mean, you know, the resilience, uh, rather than the greed, the the greed comes from this desire to go on, uh, despite all those. You can't say that, uh, Alan. Uh, Shouting already said so, desire I to win. Say something else. Yeah. I have to say something else. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so the something else. Everybody say already. I only, <laughs> I can only say something that is. Um, I always believe, right? It's it's in four Chinese word. It's called 不战而胜. That if you can go into a battle and win without even fighting, it shows that the amount of preparedness that you have, your fortitude, your your plans and your your um people are already winning even before the battle. And I think those are important things as an entrepreneur. You bring people along. 
you you bring not only your own people along, but your community along, your customers along, um, and you you head towards a direction where there's a promise of a better future. So getting people along, getting them energized about the promise of a better future. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, I'd like to end off our podcast um, with just a sentence or two from each of you about advice that you may share to aspiring entrepreneurs. Um, Jia Chen? Uh, so I think keep at it every day. You know, focus on your substance over the form. You know, remind remind yourself each day why you're doing it. You know, it's not for the bright lights. It's not for the shiny awards or anything like that. It's about the problem that you want to solve and, you know, how best you, you do do it in a way that changes the world. Yeah. I, I like that. Shaoning? Um, I would say that uh, as a founder, you need to be able to make hard decisions. There are certain decisions that's easy, there are certain decisions that you just don't want to make. But as a founder, you need to stop the problem. So you need to be able to make decisions. So don't shy away from decisions. Good or bad, make it first. Be willing to iterate based on it. Just make a decision first. No decision is no good. So decide and live with the consequences. Yes. Alan? I, I would say that um, as a founder and entrepreneur, to to really not, not just think about yourself, but people around you, exercise a lot of care for the people with you because they have also given yeah, their best for you. Okay, I cannot say anymore because Pam has a lot of things to say. <laughs> no, no, but no, yes, I mean, they, 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 they've all said all the really important things. Um, but I think at the end of the day, I think it's, to actually um, be really aware, be self-aware and be other aware, right? Uh, because in that awareness is where you will find your truth and your purpose. Uh, so I think I think that 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 journey of of um, kind of understanding yourself and the ecosystem you're in, being aware, acutely aware, uh, will help you to execute all of these things that you know has been said in the room. Thank you, Pam. So words of wis wisdoms from our founders and entrepreneurs. Um, thank you all once again for joining me on this podcast. Um, this is the um, Birthday Collective podcast on entrepreneurship. And once again, my guests are Mr. Kwok Chia Chuan, founder of Conjunct Consulting, Mr. Alan Lim, the founder of Comcrop, Ms. Pamela Chung, founder of Better Barista and Ms. Huang Xiaoning, founder of Job Central and Angel Central. And I'm Kenneth Go at Singapore Management University. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Collectively Speaking by the Birthday Collective. We aim to be a brain, heart and hand trust for Singapore, focusing on the gifts we can offer to future generations. To find out more, visit our website at thebirthdaycollective.com and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at The Birthday Collective. If you enjoyed this episode, do subscribe and drop us a review.